My name is John Houck. Uh, I live in Portland uh, in the sort of Buckman neighborhood at the moment. My studio is in that neighborhood also. And I've been making uh, pictures, I would say. And they're pictures that are, at first, they were you know, computer generated and photographed. And then as time's gone on, I've introduced more kind of mark making into the process of picture making. And so now I'm making a lot of, um, I started adding paint to, the, to my process, and now it's to the point where a lot of my work is just oil on canvas paintings as well. So I had these in the studio, these really large, very optically charged um, prints of um, gridded patterns, and uh, it just, you know, it was optically sort of too much, and it wasn't a photograph yet because there was no sense of light. Um, and I was reminded in the studio one day of what Jim Welling told me that, uh, you know, photography's ontological condition is um, light across the surface. And so I thought, well, I'll take this large print, I'll fold it so that there's a highlight and a shadow, and suddenly this flat thing uh, becomes dimensional, becomes three-dimensional. And then I photographed that to document it, and I was like, wow, it flattening out this three-dimensional fold back into a photograph really does something interesting, and why not repeat it? So then I did that again and again, and it, it ended up being this kind of process where I'd re-photograph photos, um, and they would sort of expand into three dimensions and be flattened, and this kind of game of um, re-photographing things became the template for my entire, you know, I guess, last 14 years of investigation. Uh, Anyway, I was accruing all these objects, and then one day I was like, well, why don't I photograph those in the way I was photographing the grids um, and make these kind of still lifes where I work through these objects that my parents were giving me. Um, and so I did the same process of re-photographing them, but rather than it being a grid, it was, of course, all these objects. And I, you know, for example, if it was like a coffee cup, I'd photograph the coffee cup arranged in a certain way, print that out one-to-one -one scale, as the real coffee cup is in life, and then put the object back on top of a photo of itself and photograph it again. And um, that whole process just opened up an entirely different way of thinking about work, and it became a much more personal kind of project at that point. The, the basic idea with relational psychoanalysis is that you aren't sort of motivated by kind of like these primitive drives, like Freud sort of theorized, you're more motivated and your actions and things that happen in the world are much more a result of relationships that you have um, and the, your relatedness to the world. And Winnicott has this lovely idea that two is the smallest unit of being, like you, when we're isolated, we're not ourselves. Um, it's always in relation to somebody else that things, uh, anything happens in the world. Um, so the project expanded, and I started asking friends for objects and would make a picture for them. I started seeing things, and it would remind me of a particular person, and then I would make an, uh, a piece for them. So everything started to become very um, relational. And in some of the paintings, there's that same register of the objects that are closely observed come from uh, friends or family, or yeah, there's always a kind of relatedness uh, quality to the, the objects. My daughter was born five years ago, and we have this kind of interesting communication through objects where she'll arrange her, her toys in these kind of uh, sculptures around the house. And they're, they're really intriguing uh, to me in the kind of the ways she puts different materials and objects together. And um, so it's, these, it's this new kind of still life that's emerging in my house all the time. And, you know, the objects that my parents had given me over the years, I was making photos of those, but now that I'm painting more, I, I see these sculptures that my daughter makes, and I started to um, make drawings of them. And then the first one that I turned into a painting was this sculpture that she made uh, in the house, which was um, a little watermelon, and it's made out of leather, a uh, change purse, and she nested inside of it. Uh, a wooden watermelon that's like half the scale of the change purse and it's nested inside and it has this kind of strange recursive quality to it, um, which a lot of my former photographic work has. And so this, this object just completely resonated with me and I um, made a drawing of it and then sat down and made a kind of, you know, plein air painting of, of, this, uh, of this sculpture that she made. I have a real interest in this psychoanalyst 
Donald Winnicott, and he's written extensively about the holding environment and early, early childhood in particular. And so when my daughter was born, I was able to kind of think about all those ideas from Winnicott, think about my work, and I kind of, you know, up until that point, painting had started to enter into my work and mark making more generally. So as I'm rephotographing these prints, I started making um, drawings on top of the prints or painted shadows or things that don't quite add up in the photo. In it's painted into the to the photograph. So when she was born, I, I just thought, wow, like I really should pursue this kind of more tactile quality in the work. And painting really really gave me that. So that that was really a turn toward um, toward painting. And right around the time she was born, too, I had a solo show in New York, and a few of the photos were essentially just paintings. I, I mean, that I had photographed, and I was like, well maybe it's time to break out of that frame of the photographic. And the thing that I became interested in was combining these two registers of uh, painting from imagination and painting from observation, and how could those two things live in one picture. And I think that's the thing that I'm really uh, on the cusp of, is discovering how to put in a passage or a background of painting that's really like the psychoanalytic process, where I'm just remembering with feeling making a painting based on that with no, no reference. So that's sort of one, one thing that's going on in the paintings. And then on the other side, there's kind of objects that float on top of that imagined space that are painted from observation. So recently, I've been making these paintings where I kind of, the background is entirely improvised, and it's an imagined space. But then on top of that, I'm rendering these brass bells. And this kind of back and forth between a closely observed form of depiction and an imagined form of depiction, I think, creates a, a really interesting tension in the work, and that's the thing I am really trying to pursue at the moment. There are so many artists in New York that you can find a group of people that are all within about the same three or four years of age of, as you. They maybe went to the same grad program. They're all making the same kind of work. There's this specificity and narrowness to those communities, which has some benefits, but it also, after you know, 10 years of that, it started to feel really limiting to me. Um, so once I moved to Portland, you know, almost five years ago now, my idea of community uh, expanded. Uh, suddenly I was hanging out with people who were art adjacent and much more kind of diverse uh, in, in age and um, it's been a real, a real awakening in a way to have friends who like, you know, I have a friend who has a, a perfume line and it's incredible to, to see what, how he thinks about scents and uh, fragrances and it's a whole other world that's very parallel, but one that I don't think I would have been exposed to had I stayed in such a narrow kind of community. Um, another friend who's a film editor and, um, you know, a lot of these very creative people in adjacent fields and I think my for that reason, Portland's been great to really expand um, my sense of what, what creativity is and get out of the kind of very narrow silo one can get in in a, in a place where there's a lot of people doing the same thing.